Okay, hello. So I'm Adrian, um, Adrian Westaway from Vitamins, and I'm here to talk to you about bananas, technology, and magic. Um, I'm going to uh, go kind of behind the scenes uh, with the project that we did with Samsung um, in creating a mobile phone for older people. That was the brief. Uh, I'm going to try and go into a bit of the research that we use and some of the design thinking that we um, uh, kind of came up with to, to design this. So a little bit about me first. Um, my background's in electronic uh, engineering and magic. So these were my two heroes when I was growing up, um, Tesla and Di Vernon. Um, and uh, basically growing up, you know, I wanted to be a bit of both. And it turned out that design was a, a pretty good way of getting a bit of both. Um, I got into magic when I was 11 and I wanted to make my teachers disappear. And I wrote a letter to Paul Daniels who wrote back. Um, and I just wrote um, Paul Daniels, BBC London on the envelope. Um, and it got there and I got a reply in a week and he told me everything I needed to know. That's another, that's another story. But, um, so um, I tried to turn this passion um, into a profession and I teamed up with um, a really excellent designer, Clara Gajero. Um, and Doug Fitzsimmons, who's a mechanical engineer, and we set up a design studio called Vitamins. And it's a bit of a funny thing trying to uh, know what to call it, but we call it a design and invention studio because um, we're very multidisciplinary at the core and we work on a really wide range of products. We, we're not really tied to one particular field. Um, just to give you an idea, this is a folding wheelchair wheel, so it's a full-size wheelchair wheel that, um, that can fold completely flat so you can kind of take it with you uh, on the plane, on the overhead locker, put it in the front seat of your car. Um, and that's actually in production at the moment in the States. Um, and this is some research work we did with BlackBerry, uh, looking on, look at studying interruptions, like mobile phones interrupting you. Um, and we actually developed a way of printing little messages, like little text messages, onto your finger by squeezing the phone. So you could actually squeeze the phone and the little message would actually appear on your finger. So just to give you an idea of the sort of range of work that, that we work in, um, but in this project, uh, it was a collaboration between uh, ourselves, Samsung Design in Europe, and the Helen Hamlin Center, part of the RCA. And the brief was design a phone for older people, and that was really all that we were given. Um, we tried to find out a little bit more about what older people meant, um, and nobody really wanted to talk about it, so we just kind of carried on. So we had this image, older people. And um, there's this kind of kind of popular image of older people uh, in, when you talk to a lot of designers. A lot of designers kind of think that this is what older people, uh, this, is, this means older people. Uh, people who are kind of in poverty, miserable, unhappy, uh, like things in beige and gray. Um, and it's a very negative and stigmatizing image. Um, and what we found when we were doing our research is that it looked a lot more like this. Um, and, and generally, we were very surprised as designers and in every project, every time we start a new project, we always discover so many things. Uh, but we really kind of changed our image of what, what we thought older people were. Um, and so, first thing we did was we looked at, you know, what's out there if you want to buy a phone uh, for someone who is technically an older person. And these are the sorts of things that you'll find. Now, this, was, this is a few years old, but it's not changed too much. Um, and we found this very, very depressing, uh, very stigmatizing. Um, it's really focusing on disabilities um, and not abilities. Um, so, none of these have enough digits to dial a number on your own. So, you can't actually dial a number. If you meet somebody and they give you their number on a little bit of paper, you wouldn't be able to go ahead and dial it. Some of these, you have to take the SIM card out, put it into another phone, program it into it, save it, and then put the SIM card back in the phone. So this is going to make you absolutely terrified about technology. Um, a lot of them have got, obviously, the big red SOS button, uh, which, you know, in some cases, you know, is a necessity, but in a lot of cases, it isn't, and certainly doesn't need to be kind of screaming on the front of the phone saying, I'm going to die, this is the button that I'm going to press. <laughs> Um, and this one even has three levels of emergency. So there's the operator, the tow truck, and then 911. And it's called the John Doe phone as well, which is interesting. Um, so we, we were kind of, uh, to be honest, slightly freaked out starting this project, thinking, oh, we don't really want to be entering this space. This doesn't really seem uh, like there's much space to move if we go down this route. Um, so the first thing we did is we went out and bought phones with people of all ages, so 20-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 80-year-olds. We just went out and bought phones, um, very low-tech research, just literally going out, giving people £100, saying, choose a phone, um, and we were just watching. And something amazing happened when we got back. Um, this is a video. So this is Duncan, uh, who was about 25 at the time, and Beverly, who was 65. Now, they've just bought a phone at the Carphone Warehouse, and they just got back, and they're opening the box. Now, there's a 
fundamentally different way in the way that they kind of deal with this situation. So the first thing Duncan does is he chucks the manual away, picks up the phone and starts playing with it. We ask them to try and send a text message as quickly as possible. Uh, look at what Beverly's doing. First thing she does is she grabs the user manual, you know, which makes perfect sense. She checks to make sure that the right phone is in the box and that all the kind of contents of the box are there. So she'll kind of go through and make sure everything's there. Um, she then goes through every single bit of writing, all the kind of legal, terrifying legal stuff at the beginning. Um, and then it gets to the point where she has to now like open the phone, put a SIM card in. What's a SIM card? Why am I doing this? Oh, now I have to charge it for 12 hours before I can even turn it on. And then at this stage, the phone's flying across the room uh, almost. So this is a, you know, this is the kind of, the, all that excitement, and it's really kind of powerful excitement uh, that you can really take advantage of. Like when, when Beverly was in the shop, she was really like excited. She'd just been given a new phone. Uh, it all got drained away at this point. And it's a real shame because you can really make use of that excitement in the, in the user experience. Um, so we discovered really that while companies, you know, continue to develop lots of great phones, they're really kind of missing a trick in how people uh, experience that phone, the out-of-box experience, the, the way the phone gets into their hands. And we thought, let's um, not try and design a new phone, let's try and change, let's take an existing phone and try and change the way it gets into people's hands to try and solve the problem. Um, so we went back to Samsung and asked them if that would be okay and they were very, um, very good about it and they understood the research and they let us go down this route. Um, but what we found, um, and this is some slightly old statistics now, but um, that 85% of all users of all ages reported that they were frustrated by the difficulty in getting used to a new phone. So this kind of area was actually um, a very kind of inclusive area and it meant that if we kind of solve this problem, it may you know, have impact for um, everybody. Um, so we went out and did a lot of research. Now, we don't have much time, so I can't go into all the details, but um, it's really essential uh, for us that the designers do the research. Um, that's really important. We, saw, we were given a lot of kind of uh, research documents uh, from uh, the Samsung um, before we started the project that, you know, that frankly kind of bored us to death. It was just so impossible to connect to the user just you know, through reading these reports. Um, so what we did is we made sure that we went out and did you know, home visits, really intimate visits. And again, these are like very low tech visits that we're just going there with a pen and paper. We prepared some little kind of design exercises and probes to get things going, uh, but essentially just spending time with people one on one. Because when the designer is doing the research, you're already thinking ahead, you're already thinking about the solutions, and you can kind of adapt your research to, to, to fit that. So these were very intimate, um, and we would never go in groups of more than two uh, to try. We didn't want to kind of make people feel, uh, you know, to, to, especially when you're coming into somebody's home, you don't want to kind of uh, feel too imposing. Um, now, uh, this lady uh, uh, lived um, alone and was a writer, and um, she had a, a really expensive uh, Canon SLR. Uh, camera. I was really jealous of it actually. It was a brand new one that was in a box and she'd had it for six months and she was waiting for her daughter to come back from Canada to explain to her how to use it. She hadn't opened it. She didn't even try. It still had the seal on it because she just thought, I'm not going to understand this. Um, so, you know, this was you know, very interesting. Um, and we also wanted to understand how people uh, learned things and experienced these products in groups alone and, and look at how the kind of um, how uh, you know, work, working together on solving problems might affect things. Um, this couple um, from London were a highly, highly skilled couple. Um, they had, you know, one was a physicist, and um, they'd uh, learned courses on open university, learning from the television, from the radio, they'd used all sorts of different learning media. Um, and this really showed us uh, their relationship. Um, the gentleman was the kind of tech wizard who would kind of learn everything, and then he would explain it to his wife. Uh, but it was also interesting to see the dynamic between them. Sometimes I think she maybe understood how it worked, but she kind of really enjoyed that relationship. So we were finding out a lot of things about that. Um, and then we, this is a bingo group in the, the Barbican down the road. And, you know, we spoke to people who really weren't um, living very mobile lives. So, you know, what role does a mobile phone play if you're, if you're not very mobile? And in fact, a lot of them just didn't see the benefits of it at all. They told us, you know, I just don't know why I would get one. And so I'm not going to learn because I have no, you know, why would I get one? What's it going to give to me? Um, but they were incredibly skilled at bingo and they kind of booted us out after 20 minutes because we were distracting them too much. <laughs> um, so we kind of went back to the drawing board and kind of looked at, looked at the problem and we designed some um, quite intense uh, workshops which we took to um, Norway and Italy and did one in London as well. And we really wanted to get a sort of pan-European perspective. We didn't want to just stay in the kind of London bubble. Um, and we chose um, Norway because the, the people that we were speaking to lived you know, very uh, far apart. 
um, and really you know, relied on their phones. Um, and in Italy, people have two or three or four phones and they're just talking all the time. So we were really trying to get um, a, a different kind of um, users. And this isn't, this isn't really kind of scientific research. It's not, um, it's, it's not quantitative research, it's more qualitative research. So we're really just looking for little design insights to nudge us along the way. Um, and what we did is we, we made these workshops using um, uh, a lot of activities. They lasted six hours, so it was really the whole day, um, and involved six people each time. And what we did is um, we tried to design uh, these exercises uh, where people would actually uh, create a user manual for their own phone. And we gave them everything they wanted. So if they wanted to make a video manual, we would film it for them. If they wanted to make a little play or write a novel or do anything they wanted, we would let them do it. So we didn't say, you know, write it down on a bit of paper. We left it very open. Um, then we let them kind of sell their phones to other users. So they'd have to kind of explain the benefits. You know, why would you want this phone? Why are you going to learn it? And then the user would choose, you know, they'd kind of say, okay, I'll have this one. And then we watched uh, the people swapping their phones and, and kind of learning using all the different kind of user manuals that they created. So we could kind of see not only how people wanted to teach, but how they wanted to learn as well and how successful that was. Um, and we tried not to talk about, you know, technology at all. We didn't really um, talk too much about technology and we tried to keep it very light and kind of aspirational and magical and, and there's a reason um, why this gentleman here is kind of writing on a banana I guess I've been hiding it um, instead of kind of giving people these sort of uh, you know saying what's wrong with your mobile how would you make it better and kind of cornering them with this sort of mobile phone mentality and all the kind of uh, problems associated with that we, we gave them bananas and we said turn this banana into your dream phone it can do anything you want and again we gave them anything they wanted stickers felt tip pens everything and then um, everybody created uh, these quite honest portrayals of what they wanted their phone to do. Um, and it was really interesting because if you, um, if you look at that, if you remember that first image of the kind of stigmatizing phones with just four digits, um, the, you know, these, are, these phones have been designed assuming that um, people want a very limited um, set of functions, that they just want to be able to make a phone call. Um, uh, but what the people really told us is that they wanted quite complex phones, that like they don't look very um, easy, they look like they do a lot of things. Um, and they wanted these phones to be quite social tools. They wanted a smartphone like everyone else. What I think. Um, but he did, you know, nevertheless tell us, you know, there's TV there. Um, this could, I remember this one could open the gate when he got home. I think this is a Norwegian banana. Um, but uh, it could do a lot of, um, you know, complicated things. Um, this other banana uh, was my, my favorite. Um, this had a button to make the kids happy and go to bed. So just push that, they're happy and they go to sleep. Um, and what was really interesting with this one is it had a, a map on it and a little flashing dot. Um, and this was a GPS. Um, what was even more interesting is that the gentleman who made this banana had uh, a Nokia phone with a GPS already on it. Um, and I asked him, you know, you, you know, you've told me that if I could make your dreams come true, you'd have a GPS, you know, in your phone and you've got one. Um, and he, he just had no idea. He hadn't explored it. He said, oh, I, I thought maybe there was something on there, but I never really got around to finding it. You know, I, I'm not very good with these things. So we realized there was a real problem in kind of helping people to kind of explore. Um, we think because maybe uh, people were kind of scared of breaking things, you know, the kind of maybe the, the, the mental models of kind of maybe mechanical things breaking. Um, when you think about software, you kind of still think I can break this if I make a mistake. Whereas in reality, a lot of the time you can just kind of play around with a phone and it, you won't really break it. Um, so, you know, we had lots of bananas and it took us a really long time to try and figure out what they all meant. Um, some of them, we, st you know, we still don't know. Um, this, <laughs> this one here um, predicted Siri. This is, everyth this is in Italy uh, on the snow. Uh, everything vocal, even SMS. Um, so that's basically a phone that you can talk to. Uh, the one at the back, coffee please, films. Um, I can't remember what the one behind that says. But, you know, again, uh, it really confirmed that people wanted all the functionality out of a smartphone, all the kind of social benefits that a smartphone could give you. So we were kind of convinced this was, uh, we were in the, working in the right space. So we looked at the sort of ex current experience, and this is sort of what you have at the moment, what you had in that first video. Um, you have the user and these kind of three sort of separate elements that are quite often designed in three completely different places by people who don't really talk to each other. Um, there's the manual, there's the box, the kind of packaging, and then there's the device itself. Um, and within the device, there's the kind of physical design of the device and the interface. Um, and we found that these things just weren't really working together, making uh, quite a complicated and confusing user experience. So we wanted to try and create a solution to bring all of these things together in one place. And rather than design a new phone, 
uh, we wanted to try and create some sort of bridge between uh, an existing phone and the user. And we wanted that bridge to be uh, something analog, something familiar, something that made sense, that would help you just understand how to use a normal phone like everyone else. Um, and we came up with um, several different solutions. I'm going to talk about two today. Um, now, the first one was based on that gentleman with a GPS on his banana who was too scared to explore his phone, and he never found out he had a GPS. And um, what we wanted to try and do is find a way of helping people explore what was inside their phone in a really kind of familiar way. Um, and we thought cards are a fantastic uh, familiar model. Um, you know, everyone we spoke to had used cards before, understood, you know, a uh, pack, of, pack of cards. And we designed this uh, kind of concept, um, and this is the kind of just of a research concept, um, so that when you bought the phone, you'd kind of pull it out with a ribbon, and there would be a stack of cards in the bottom of the box. Now, these cards actually explain every function on the phone. Um, so it's really, really easy to know. My phone does this much stuff, um, and I can just go through it like this and take my time and understand what it does. Um, if you give somebody um, any smartphone and you ask them, you know, how much stuff can it do or how much do you know about this phone, that's a very, very difficult thing to understand. Um, you can kind of try and tackle this in the interface by kind of helping people see how much of a percent they know, but it's not very intuitive. We thought that this was actually really, really simple and quick. Um, we tried all sorts of experiments with icons and, and, and graphics. Um, and what we found was that, you know, the icons just cluttered the whole experience, confused things even more. Let's just write down what it does, just call someone instead of a kind of picture of a, a face and a phone next to it. Um, and this explained everything that your phone did, so people could just flick through them. But they're um, not normal cards, they're magic cards. Um, because when you, <laughs> when you tap the, the card on the phone, uh, using NFC, which is like um, the Oyster card essentially, which is already in a lot of phones and is kind of going to really... Um, come out um, this year with uh, mobile payments. Uh, using NFC, you could actually detect what card is being put onto the, the front of the phone. So by tapping the card on the phone, it would actually just jump straight to that function. So the card's a sort of analog shortcut, you know? You can kind of just tap it and you'll jump to that function. Um, and we designed them so that um, you could actually take them with you. So a lot of people uh, told us, well, maybe you know, I might want to take one or two with me and learn them when I'm traveling or something. So we kind of designed them so you could put them in your wallet. Um, and the whole point of this uh, kind of approach, though, was not to sort of replace an existing phone. It was to empower people to use a normal phone like everyone else. So we actually kind of designed the card so they would just teach you on the back how to get to that function. And generally, it was just a couple of clicks away. So this is the calculator uh, on a Samsung phone. And it's, you know, tap the menu, tap the organizer, tap calculator, and you're there. Um, and the, the hope was that, you know, after using this one or two times, people would be able to see quite quickly that they could get to it um, on the phone. And then if they want to keep using the cards, they can. But, um, you know, maybe at that stage they can just use the phone um, uh, independently. It's really up to them. And, you know, these are just some pictures of some of the prototypes. So you can see, you know, uh, as designers, you kind of get carried away. And we started trying to make folding cards with origami and all these little things. And it just got really confusing again. So these are some, like, early prototypes. Um, and then we kind of cracked it and decided to just, you know, use text um, and trying to sort of imply that these cards were, were slightly um, magical in the graphic design. So these are ones that we didn't use. Um, so the next idea um, and the kind of main one that I was going to talk about today uh, was uh, based on another sort of analog model, like a, a mental model, that was familiar uh, to a lot of people, and that was the book. Uh, a lot of times we would kind of speak to people and ask them, you know, where, where is your user manual now? Uh, how often do you use it? Uh, and a lot of people that we spoke to had held on to their manual. They'd kind of held on to their box as well, and the, the manual might be in a box, in another box, in a drawer, somewhere, you know, for an emergency, but um, it was, you know, seldom actually consulted. Um, so we, we thought, you know, it would be great if you could make a manual that had a place because people are putting them in their drawers or different kind of places, but they don't really have a place because a manual is usually a flimsy bit of paper that's not really been designed to go anywhere. You know, if you put it in your um, handbag or something, then it's going to disintegrate in about a week because the paper is so cheap. Uh, but you can't really kind of put it on your shelf either. And that got us thinking about books. You know, if the manual was a real book, uh, a nice book, then it, you could probably put it on your shelf and not, you know, you, with everything else, and you just pick it when you, need, when you need help. And again, I guess as designers, we started playing around with the idea of a book and what a book could be. And we thought, well, what if the kind of book actually is the packaging as well? And I'm going to show you uh, what I mean in this next video. So um, 
we redesigned the whole packaging and we used the standard dimensions of, of an existing Samsung box. Uh, so this is actually what you'd buy in the shop. Uh, it's got two books in it and we used the Samsung phone at the time. Um, so the first book is the setup book. So this is the bit when you have to put the SIM card in and it's usually when the phone gets thrown across the room. Um, now we use you know, language just like any other book, um, kind of talking to you like a book. And it tells you what a SIM card is. Um, it's the heart and soul of your phone. You, know, you, you don't know what a SIM card is at the beginning. Um, and you can take that SIM card out. And the next thing it shows you is actually where it goes in the phone, because the phone's actually suspended in the book. So the actual packaging is the, the manual. Next thing is where the battery is. And you turn the page, and it shows you where that goes in, in the phone. So in this way, we're kind of using the kind of really like f familiar you know, linearity of a book to break down the steps of the, of the setup process, making it into kind of quite a playful, uh, but hopefully not too patronizing way either. It shouldn't feel like a kid's book, and it shouldn't feel like a book that's made for older people. It should just feel like a book. Um, and that was a real challenge in the kind of font and language that we use to try and make it, not make it feel stigmatizing. So now you've set up the phone, you've got the user manual. This is where you learn how to use your phone. And there was a contents page, like a normal book. And we didn't write MMS, you know, we wrote pictures. And we tried to kind of explain the benefits. You know, why would you want to send a picture? Because uh, if you explain the benefits, then people are likely to spend a bit more time learning something. And now the phone actually fits inside the user manual. And all the instructions actually point to where you have to physically push on the phone. Um, a lot of people, when we were watching them using uh, touchscreen phones, weren't familiar with the whole touch interface. And there was a, 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 lot, a long time before they would actually kind of start pressing and knowing where to press. So we used this kind of finger prodding symbol, you know, just to say, you know, just go and press here. Um, and we kind of designed it in such a way that, um, you know, every page turn was a kind of new screen. And again, it was really tempting to go overboard and let the phone be aware of what page you're on and automatically change. But we kept things really, really simple. Um, so it just tells you um, step by step how to do each thing. Um, so hopefully, um, I'll just go to the next page. Here we I'll go. I'll just say that that's quite inspired because I'm part of a generation that would actually cut out the centre of a book, a secret thing. Oh, yeah, exactly. Back to the bookshop. Yeah, exactly. So it's the so James. When you were at university, that was the best way to keep your secret items. Yeah, it still is. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the kind of James. Hopefully, you can see that by kind of you know performing this research, and you know we can talk about it later in, in more detail about the actual research. Um, we tried to kind of look at the problem in a completely different way, not designing a new phone, trying to change the way the phone gets into people's hands. Um, and hopefully, the solution is something that empowers people and doesn't stigmatize them. Doesn't you know this? I think feels like it could work for any age. It doesn't really scream out that this is for any particular age. Um, and that was really the intention. Um, so thank you very much. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Thanks. I think that really resonated certainly with me and I think with the rest of the audience. A quick question on the, how did Samsung react? How was the big corporate response to, well, hold on, we told you to build Vegas yeah. on the phone. I mean, what did they say? Well, we were really lucky because this was a collaboration with the Helen Hamlin Center as well, that um, all of this w w research was, was going to be shared uh, publicly because a lot of the time in these sorts of projects, we can never, you know, unfortunately never really share the, the kind of research behind these things. Um, and so they were already kind of open to kind of new research methodologies, which was very lucky. Um, it would have maybe been trickier, you know, initially had we just been kind of doing a kind of standard consulting project. Um, it took a lot of convincing and it, it really that video uh, where we put the two people uh, next to each other is what kind of did the trick. Um, I think if we just told them, you know, in words, it might have been quite hard to really understand. But that video really kind of summed it up. When we were put the two together, we really kind of thought, OK, you can't really deny you know, what you're seeing. So yeah, definitely, you know, using the videos from the research was very important in convincing them. I don't know, they haven't called. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I mean, um, it's interesting that you mentioned Apple because they've kind of, I mean, a lot of people have gone down this route now. Um, it's great nowadays, you don't have to put the SIM card in yourself. The batteries sort of built into the phone now. It's gotten a lot easier than it was when we started this. But um, still, Apple um, don't really have a user manual for their phone. They'll give you a, a very you know, beautiful little leaflet, which will tell you to go and download a PDF. Um, and I think you know, a Apple have done some fantastic things in terms of usability with their devices. But I think that that's a little bit um, strange, because you know, that's, 
somebody who doesn't even know what a PDF is, and then they're going to get asked to install Adobe Acrobat, and they're going to go down this whole kind of third-party route, which is, it all depends on how old the computer is and if it even opens the, the PDF file. I don't feel that that's a very good solution um, in this context. So I think it's a bit scary when we kind of go down this sort of PDF manual route. I think there's a risk of alienating people still. And you look like you're biased. Yeah. So, the, I mean, this was actually a research project, so um, it was all made public and kind of is in the public domain. So, um, you know, the Samsung could kind of take some of the insights from this and do things from it, and as could any other company. So it's not kind of out as a product as is, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's interesting. <laughs> the Kit Kat. It's interesting that you mentioned the tea because that was a kind of idea at the beginning. Can we make use of the sort of like, uh, and, uh, and some several people have like different marketing tricks where they'll give you you know a tea bag and tell you to go and sign up for something on a website, um, it, and that was an interesting idea to kind of really make that sort of moment of learning a, a real pleasure and ritual. Um, so interesting. Yeah. Cool. Thank right. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.